Hello, everyone. My name is Reed Blakemore, Deputy Director of the Global Energy Center at the Atlantic Council. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our wonderful event today, Preparing the United States for a Minerals Intensive Future. A global energy transition towards low carbon, renewable energy resources places mineral supply chains at a transformational moment. Policies designed to incentivize the deployment of electric vehicles, solar PV and wind power, and other clean energy technologies is poised to stimulate unprecedented demand growth for the mineral supply chains which they rely on. Coupled with continued advancements in pharmaceutical, defense, and telecommunication technologies that have historically supported minerals demand, a step change in the role of mineral resources within global trade and economic productivity is emerging. In short, our energy and economic future, though hopefully less emissions intensive, will be considerably more mineral intensive. This augurs several challenges which the United States, as a country at the forefront of this transition, and a number of other countries will need to confront very soon and set the scene for our discussion today. The first is the scale of the challenge and the impact it might have on our ability to meet the mineral demands of the near future. Last year, the International Energy Agency projected a fourfold increase in demand for key energy transition minerals by 2040 in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement and a six-fold increase to reach global net zero by 2050. Furthermore, a supply chain review by the Biden administration last year found that the minerals required to fully electrify the US light duty vehicle fleet with lithium ion batteries would constitute approximately 127, 245, and 114% of the total nickel, lithium, and cobalt that was mined in 2019. Projected supplies for many of these minerals are, for now, woefully insufficient. Equally as daunting is the breadth of minerals and metals which will be exposed to this demand growth. Well-known supply chain challenges for cobalt, rare earths, graphite, and lithium will also be felt in niche minerals markets, such as indium or tellurium, in addition to base metals markets like nickel and copper. A second issue is the geopolitics surrounding the importance of these mineral supply chains. Establishing secure and resilient access to mineral resources and supply chains is now emerging as a core priority, one in which perceived risks to energy security and economic security are at play as a result of concentration for increasingly critical minerals and materials. Closely related is the emerging reality that influence throughout mineral supply chains will reflect leadership in the manufacturing of renewable energy and other important defense and telecommunication innovations introducing geopolitical and geoeconomic fault lines as countries jockey for leadership in the industries of the future. A final issue is the imperative that, more mineral, that a more mineral intensive future is still sustainable and resilient. Care must be taken to ensure that the production of minerals to power climate goals don't come at the expense of environmental and labor best practices. Similarly, a more minerals dependent economy will not succeed if the markets and supply chains underpinning that economy are not also well-governed and transparent. These issues are complex and cross-cutting, but nonetheless demand the urgent attention of the United States as it positions itself in a more minerals-intensive world. To that end, I'm happy to be welcoming a distinguished group of policymakers and experts to the Atlantic Council today to unpack these issues. That includes Ambassador J. Peter Pham, distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council and former U.S. Special Envoy for the Sahel and the Great Lakes region of Africa. Ambassador Douglas Lute, former ambassador, to, U.S. ambassador to NATO and former lieutenant general in the U.S. Army. And Helena Matza, Helena Matza, director at the Office of Energy Transformation in the Bureau of Energy Resources at U.S. State Department. And finally, I'm also incredibly honored on behalf of the Atlantic Council to welcome Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, who will be offering us keynote remarks. Now, the senator is currently opening a hearing and will be joining us in a few minutes for keynote remarks. Uh, so in the interim, we'll briefly hear from our experts to continue to set the scene for our discussion today. Just one note beforehand, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are on the record and live streaming this virtual session on the Atlantic Council YouTube page. If you'd like to follow along with the conversation on Twitter, you can join in using the handle at AC Global Energy or the hashtag AC Energy. I'll also be taking audience questions throughout the event and passing them along to our panel. So if you would like to ask a question uh, of our panelists, well, I'm actually being told that we have the Senator here and ready to go right now. So we're just gonna move to that and we'll cover the logistics later. Uh, Senator Murkowski, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, you know, we're so excited to hear your remarks. Thank you for joining us. I'll turn it over to you for your remarks. Well, thank you, Reed. I appreciate that. And sorry for a little bit of jump ball, but as you mentioned, I am 
I'm hopping out of an Indian Affairs Committee and we're in between witnesses, so this works out just, just fine. So I, I appreciate this, this chance to speak about what I feel is a very, very important topic, one that deserves far more attention than it has currently be getting, been getting. So I'm very appreciative that you're holding this event. To, um, to really begin, I, I think we have to ask the question, why a minerals intensive future is such a challenge. And I, I would start by pointing out that whether, whether we realize it or not, minerals are the foundation of a modern society. They're critical for absolutely everything from, from computer chips to, to skyscrapers, from toothpaste to advanced defense systems. One of the best statistics perhaps that I've seen comes from the National Academy of Sciences. They estimate that 25,000 pounds of new minerals are needed per person per year in the United States to make the items that we use for basic human needs, for infrastructure, for energy, for transportation, communications, defense. I mean, it's, it's really pretty staggering when you, when you put it into context that way. And our mineral dependence isn't necessarily a problem, but it is directly connected to a problem, and that is our foreign mineral dependence. For all the attention that our dependence on foreign oil has drawn over the years, our dependence on foreign minerals is actually deeper and, and still growing. According to the USGS, we imported at least 50% of our supply of 47 mineral commodities in 2021, including 100% of 17 of them. And that counts all 17 rare earth elements as one commodity. And that's kind of a snapshot of, of where, where we are right now. But, but the trend line is, is taking us in the wrong direction. Back in 1978, we imported at least 50% of our supply of just 25 mineral commodities and 100% of just seven of them. So you can see where we're trending in a bad pattern here. Another concerning factor is the concentration of where our supply is coming from. Minerals are just not divided equally around the world. They're found where they are found. And we tend to import what we need for each one of them from a handful of producing countries. China, in particular, has consolidated its control and domination of supply chains for rare earths, graphite, other critical minerals. You, all you need to do, just do a, a, a quick keyword search in the latest minerals commodities summaries report, and you're going to see China come up 371 times. Now, as we are all anxiously watching the crisis in Ukraine, it's also worth taking stock of what we depend on Russia for. That's about 90% uh, of our neon, 35% of our palladium, which has huge ramifications for our semiconductor industry. And, and so when you think about Think about what this really means. Re Russia could, could try to leverage us on those. It's easy to see China doing something similar over Taiwan. Um, I've said before that I think foreign mineral dependence has, has become our Achilles heel. Uh, it could lead, I think, to some awful choices and consequences if we don't address it. And in looking ahead, global demand for minerals um, we know are set to skyrocket. It's only going to, to become more and more acute. I, I remember talking about this with uh, Dr. Birol at the International Energy Agency several years ago. His agency has done some fabulous work since then to project what's ahead as it relates to the energy trans transition. And IEA found that on average, a single electric vehicle requires more than 200 kilograms of critical minerals. So each megawatt of offshore wind requires about 8,000 kilograms of copper, close to 1,000 kilograms of zinc, and substantial amounts of nickel, manganese, chromium, molybdenum, and, and rare earths. Last year, IEA forecast that by 2040, the world could be using 42 times more lithium than it is today, along with 25 times more graphite, 21 times more cobalt, 19 times more nickel and seven times more rare earths. I mean, you, you got to ask the question, are you ready for that? And I would suggest that it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible 
to suggest that we are. We're a couple of decades behind where we need to be, but Congress has taken some important steps over the past 15 months to help grow our domestic supply and address our foreign mineral dependency. In November of 2020, the last month of my chairmanship of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, we passed my Energy Act. This was the first modernization of our energy laws in over a decade. It carried about 90% of another bill that I'd introduced, which is known as the American Mineral Security Act. That is now in law. And through that, we updated federal policy on critical minerals. We codified the critical minerals list, uh, required it to be updated regularly. We provided authorizations for geological surveying, forecasting, the development of alternatives and substitutes, recycling, and workforce development. We really took a comprehensive approach because that's what we need. And it, it sounds kind of cliche, but we basically applied an all of the above strategy to minerals. And then we built on that last year, I think in a major way through our bipartisan infrastructure bill. That measure included the final piece of my mineral security bill to streamline our, our notoriously slow permitting system. We added $825 million for projects to help reverse our slow mineral, our foreign mineral dependence. Uh, there was $3 billion to build domestic supply chains for EVs and batteries. We also made critical mineral projects eligible for Department of Energy's loan guarantee program. And I think that that's a good start, but it's now the Biden administration's responsibility to implement those laws and, and make a difference with the authorities and the funding that Congress has provided. And we've seen, we've seen some positive signs, including the president's executive order on supply chain uh, and the 100 day review that followed that. But there's still a fundamental incoherence in its decisions. There's a serious disconnect in my view between what the Department of Energy and others are saying about the importance of minerals and what the Department of Interior and Forest Service are actually doing. And we're seeing a lot of delay. We're seeing key projects taken off the table. And I think that that is to our own detriment. And it won't be long before China and Russia or another country is gonna make us pay for it. You know. They, they say that when you're in a hole, the first thing that you, we should do is stop digging. But I think in this case, the best thing that we can do is actually to start digging. We need more mines in America and states like, like Alaska have incredible mineral base that can be tapped to meet domestic and global demand. And as much as anything that's gonna require a change in mindset and approach from many policymakers and from the leaders at our federal agencies, Instead of allowing our best projects to be delayed or, or just delayed to the point of shutting down, we need to be working to facilitate them. It, it's hard to imagine the U.S. being serious about its mineral needs unless we are actively advancing good projects. Um, my state, we've got a good handful of them. Ambler Road, which will provide access to an entire mining district. Graphite One is a world-class deposit in, in northwest uh, Alaska. Uh, down in the southeastern part of the state, we have Bokan Mountain, which is a substantial rare earth project. Uh, Alaska has six major mines right now, but we need to double or triple that to get ahead of what we see coming. And we need to recognize that our recent steps are only the start of what we need to be doing. We need to take all those options that are available to us. I think one worth considering is the Defense Production Act, which allows the president to declare an emergency and devote additional resources to address it. I think, in fairness, that our own mineral security fits that criteria, and the Department of Defense should be empowered to help address it. The sooner we treat our mineral security as a genuine threat to our economy, our competitiveness, and our security, I think the better off we will be. And I'm also convinced that all all sides taking this seriously would help unlock broader Republican support for clean energy policies to help address climate change. We, we, we should not be afraid of a future that is mineral intensive, but we should be afraid of one where we have chosen not to produce the resources that we need and to instead depend upon others, especially given the consequences that entails for the environment and for the global order.
There are reasonable policies. I think they can help us dig out of this mess. Um, we started to put them in place. We've got more work to do. But I think this has to be a sustained focus for all of us, likely for decades to come. So I appreciate the focus that Atlantic Council is giving this very significant and very timely issue to today. So thank you for letting me airdrop in at, at this time. And I, I'm, I'm sure your panel is going to be um, uh, enlightening in, in so many ways. Um, but thank you again to Atlantic Council for, for advancing this initiative. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And while we recognize you have to drop in and drop out, you, you have some important business to attend to. But before you leave, I just want to thank you for your leadership throughout your career on these issues. You certainly have been ringing the bell as it relates to uh, the urgency of action in this space for a long time now. And I think hopefully we can finally see some action begin to be to be laid into the ground quite literally. Uh, so thank you. And uh, we hope to have you around next time. Thanks so much, Reed. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye now. Uh, so now let's move on to our expert panel. But before we get there, uh, I just want to finish off the logistical items. We will be taking questions from the audience uh, throughout this session, uh, but we'll be only using the Zoom, the Zoom Q&A function. So unfortunately, if you're watching over YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, we won't be able to take your questions. But if you register through the Atlantic Council's event webpage, join us on Zoom. You can use the Q&A function here to uh, be a part of the conversation and I'll be feeding these questions in throughout, uh, throughout our event today. Um, I'd like now to actually turn uh, to, you know, we have, we have, fortunately now we can do these first round of questions with the reflection of what the Senator just said. And I'd like to actually turn to you first, Ambassador Pham. Uh, you've been exploring this space for, for some time now, and I think it'd be useful for you to help add some color to what a more mineral intensive future actually looks like. Where does the U.S. fit into a more competitive global supply chain, both on the supply and demand side? And, you know, in reference to kind of the challenges, both the senator and that I mentioned earlier on, you know, what key trends are going to continue to shape the playing field for the United States moving into the future here? Thank you very much, Reid, for to you and your colleagues at the Global Energy Center for pulling together this uh, this dynamic discussion this afternoon on this important topic. And uh, I re really appreciate Senator Murkowski's leadership and her setting the scene for our discussion today. Uh, I think before I get started, though, I'd like to just tease out something. We often throw that term and we hear it said critical minerals. And it's thrown about, I don't want to say somewhat lazily, but it is thrown about. I think we need to distinguish between, and the Senator uh, was very implicit about, between those minerals which are truly limited in quantity or distribution around the globe, cobalt, where 70% of the world's cobalt is produced in one country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But then this overlay that with the supply chain issue, which is of that 70%, all but two of the mines producing the cobalt in the DRC are controlled uh, or owned by China, which overall globally processes 75% of the world's cobalt. So it creates a supply chain uh, bottleneck. There are also the rare earths, which are not well distributed around the globe. Uh, currently outside of China, there are only three operating producing rare earth projects. There are a number of others there in the trial phases, but only three. So that's critical. But there's the other definition of critical, which is the, and the Senator, I think, gave some wonderful examples of that. Those are the base metals that we need even greater quantities of just to make the energy transition. Um, demand going up. My 10-year-old automobile, my sedan, the American-made sedan I drive around in, has about 22 kilograms of copper in it. If I were to invest in an electric vehicle, a slip wraps, I'm looking at four times that much uh, in copper required. The Senator mentioned the amount of copper needed in wind turbines. The same nickel. Uh, nickel prices earlier this week uh, hit highs that we haven't seen in over a decade because the demand for class one nickel. So all these things which we need to make the tra transition. Now, there's some points, you know, I'd like to make the Senator... I think they have a very good case. I think it is an all of the above uh, response to this. We need to develop responsibly, cleanly uh, domestic supplies. But there is, I think we have to be frank, there's an impossibility of autarky. Geography and geology 
limit. There's some things we're not going to find here. So we need to start thinking about how we de-risk the supply chain. And we can get into that. But, uh, you know, let me uh, turn it back to you, Reid, and let uh, Ambassador Lute and Helena get in on the conversation. Yeah, you mentioned, I think you mentioned a, a number of things I think we want to unpack uh, later on, but I do want to turn to Ambassador Lute, particularly on this geo, question of geopolitics and geoeconomics. Uh, you know, the senator mentioned uh, the, the the dominance of China in this space. Um, you know, as Ambassador Pham mentioned, uh, you know, a huge, the, the vast majority of the cobalt that, that we need for this transition comes out of the DRC. You know, Geopolitics seems to be a bit of an all-consuming piece of this discussion around critical mineral supply chain, and and that's especially true here in Washington. You know, how should uh, a more mineral-intensive world be kind of reshaping our own notions of uh, energy and economic security here in the United States? Well, thanks for that, Reed. Uh, You know, I'm probably the least qualified on this panel to address the specifics of critical minerals, right? You have Peter, we have expertise from the State Department, the Senator herself. Um, But I am a student of strategy, right? And what strikes me here is that we have a significant national problem, but we do not have a strategy. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me just unpack this. It kind of takes us back to the basics, right? By strategy, I mean the alignment of ends, ways, and means over time. So what we're trying to accomplish, the goals, right? Those are the ends. The ways, how we're going to go about addressing this problem of the methods, the techniques, and so forth. And then finally, the means, the resources. Uh, And these have to be aligned top to bottom over time if we're going to declare that we have a strategy. And I think we've taken a shortcut here. I think we've declared that we have a problem, but we don't actually have a three-part strategy lined up uh, to accomplish the, the objectives of a green economy, for example. So we have a declaration, we have a declaratory policy, but we don't actually have an implementation strategy. Uh, and we have to, as we've already heard, we have to have sufficient, reliable access to key minerals like cobalt, lithium, copper, and others. And the challenge today is we simply don't have access. We don't have assured access to those critical minerals. So we are short on the means in the strategic equation. Uh, And we simply can't get there from here on the current path. Now, we'll talk this morning, correction this afternoon, about all types of different ways, different approaches. You heard from the Senator, uh, her emphasis on optimizing domestic sourcing and -hmm. production. So that's a piece of the puzzle. Um, You also heard her mention strategic reserves that would provide resilience in the case of supply chain disruptions. I think that's a piece of the puzzle. Another way here though, and I think this is gonna be the weight of our conversation this afternoon, is how to secure supply chains to where, as Peter says, the geography and the geology line up and actually hold the promise of access to these key minerals. So we're gonna have to address a blend of all these different ways, a package, if you will, in order to arrive at the point where we can say we have a strategy for a green economy. That's really what this panel is all about. And I think to begin, I would like to just emphasize that today we have a problem, but we don't have a strategy. Mm-hmm. I think you, you you teed us up actually fantastically to, to now move to Helena. You're right that uh, the senator did a fantastic job of, of mentioning uh, the problem and the domestic side of that, of that, the domestic tools available to create a strategy to resolve that problem. Helena, in, in your remit at, at State ENR, you're looking at this, you know, very much from an international perspective in terms of what the U.S. can be doing and, and needs to be doing more of uh, to ensure supply chain security, stability and resiliency um, at an international level with international partners. Uh, you know, how is the how is the United States working at that international level? And specifically, I'd, we'd be interested in hearing, you know, what are, what are you and your colleagues at ENR doing uh, in this space? Sure, happy to do that and really looking forward to participating in this discussion, especially as we get a little bit more into that strategy element. But let me take a step back and just uh, introduce a little bit about what, what we're doing. So, Reed, as you mentioned, um, I am representing the State Department's Bureau of Energy Resources, where we really lead the development and execution of the U.S. international energy policy. And in this role, we sit at the nexus right of energy security and foreign policy. 
And as we keep modernizing our approach to energy security, the State Department is really leading the way in contributing to two related Biden-Harris administration priorities. One, our efforts to secure supply chains for critical minerals. And then two, how we're elevating climate as a key tenant of our foreign policy by promoting a low carbon future. We know to meet our own climate commitments, but for our ability to help the world meet theirs, that demand for minerals that fuel these technologies will soar. We've heard some pretty staggering statistics already. Let me add uh, just one additional element. I think the IEA and Benchmark Intelligence and, and all these other um, shops are doing an amazing job uh, sharing some of the potential forecasting. Um, but right now, EVs and battery storage are already displacing consumer electronics as the largest consumer of lithium. We're seeing the shift. We already are experiencing it in real time. And we know this demand will only grow. The administration is really attacking and acting with the urgency that the climate crisis requires to secure diverse, resilient supply chains to meet that expected dramatic increase in demand. As many of you know, next week is the one-year anniversary of the executive order that the Senator referenced on American supply chains, which set in motion a comprehensive set of administration actions. Some of them we already talked about, some that I think we'll hear more about uh, closer to that anniversary date. But where we sit at the State Department, we recognize the fact that we can't do that alone. Geology tells us we can't do it alone. Um, what we know about our own, own reserves, what we know about other partnerships and where and how processing will ultimately make sense. We know that we need to do this in partnership as well. Uh, and the State Department is really focusing on that piece, right? And we're ramping up our foreign policy with like-minded partners to secure these supply chains. And when we say that, we mean working on the mining, processing, recycling, and ultimately end use. Uh, these efforts include working with governments through various diplomatic engagements, and we have several really um, thoughtful bilateral critical mineral dialogues already in the works through technical assistance where my team is already spending and, 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 and working with partners uh, with over $25 million of technical assistance in the field on these issues. And then of course, with the private sector and multilateral organizations. And maybe I'll highlight just one of, of the initiatives we're working on before turning it back over. Um, the Energy Resource Governance Initiative, or ERGI, was created with a group of founding partners spanning four continents in 2019. And, and the goal of that initiative was to ensure that clean energy supply chains really are not only diverse and robust, but adhere to the highest environmental, social, and governance standards. The State Department is now expanding those efforts, working with several partner countries, coordinating on critical minerals, including information sharing, identifying gaps related to mineral exploration, processing trade flows, investment opportunities, and of course, doubling down on the elevation of these ESG standards, including promoting stronger recycling, which I hope we get a chance to talk about a little bit more. Um, we believe that this is really the, the approach of the sustained diplomatic engagement and strategic partnerships on the international side will complement our, our domestic efforts. So I'll pause there. Thank you. And I think, you know, this this idea of partnership building and partner capacity building, I think, is is one that we need to actually uh, do some some thinking about in addition, because in so many ways, this is well, you know, we're here today to talking about this as a U.S. problem. This is a problem that other partner countries are going to be dealing with. And as the senator mentioned, you know, the U.S. domestic resources can be part of a solution to a broader global problem. In fact, they should be in some cases. So the U.S. is an active partner in this, not just an off taker in so many ways. But I think, uh, doc Dr. Fama, I'd love to kind of turn to you to, you know, on this issue of partnerships. Right. You mentioned that, you know, autarky definitely isn't it isn't a solution here. Um, Helena mentioned that we need to be looking across the different the different components of the supply chain. You know, when you when you look at the possible partnership models that are that are kind of in development um, up and down the supply chain, where do you see opportunities for the U.S. to get more involved? Well, thank you, Reed. Um, I think there are several opportunities. Uh, first, uh, the lesson I would take away is we need to take a more active role not just diplomatically, but the private sector uh, and really the, uh, the whole of American society 
in nurturing the global supply chains that we need over the longer term. Uh, Helena mentioned ERGI, uh, which is a great initiative uh, helping the governance, the mining sector. Uh, but I think we need to be even uh, plus that up. You know, the, the idea of the bottlenecks that occur in the global supply chains, some of which actually are, it's ironic because we're seeking these minerals where need, the demand is growing because we want to make a transition to cleaner, uh, a cleaner technology. But how clean is it to pack up unrefined ore in the Congo and ship it halfway around the world? How much carbon is consumed to be processed somewhere else? Uh, it's it's an absurdity and it's an irony. But you know, the, we need to work on the supply chain and helping that will help not only unblock a bottleneck, but also potentially be a greener approach to it. So I think widening our aperture and what we mean by building that supply chain. We also need to establish best practices and criteria for partnering. In some cases, you know, uh, ideally we work, uh, in the ideal world, we'd only work with like the like-minded, but in reality and geology will, can, will force us to sometimes as we did in the 20th century with petroleum, uh, in the 21st century, we will need to work with countries that we may not agree with on everything. But let's figure the criteria. We need to distinguish between state-owned enterprises and privately held enterprises that may be domiciled uh, in a country with which we have political differences. We need to establish criteria, the red lines for this type of thing. So I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. I don't have this, the answers to all of it. I think it's one that we have. And then finally, the, the question of processing. Uh, as the report from the 100-day review uh, ordered by President Biden pointed out, a certain country in East Asia has used everything from uh, failure to control uh, for environmental best practices to uh, subsidies to price distortions to acquire a monopoly on processing of certain critical minerals. Uh, it's been pointed out. But now to deal with that, how do we help build up and empower competitors? And I think part of that's going to be, the Senator spoke earlier about strategic reserves. I think offtake agreements are going to be necessary. One of the most interesting things, uh, as you know, uh, Reed, I'm so, somewhat of a Frank, not just a Francophone, but a Francophile. If you go to La Rochelle in France, a lovely uh, artist studio uh, in this old industrial building. It's actually very lovely. If you didn't, if you dig a little deeper, just two decades ago, that was the world's largest rare earth processing plant in the world. It's now out of business and been turned into an art studio because relentless, uh, it was driven out of business by price distortions and unfair competition. So offtake agreements are going to be probably part of the equation to help build a resilient supply chain and to build a, a more competitive market. You know, I think you mentioned, I, I might turn back to Helena quickly on that, on that idea of the more active role in beefing up initiatives like ERGI. Uh, you know, Helena, you mentioned that you're, you know, you're, you're continually doing more work about, you know, build, expanding the tent of, uh, of folks you're engaging in, Ergi. Um, what other tools and I ideas do, do you currently have in play on, the, on you know, to, within Ergi or outside of Ergi, quite frankly, to build, allow the United States to play a more active role in not just uh, building uh, partnerships with foreign governments, but facilitating the kind of offtake partnerships in the private sector that are going to be necessary in this space? It's a great question. Um, let me highlight a, a couple elements of, of how we're really looking at our, our work. And I, I like the terminology ERGI plus, because I think that's very much how we're, we're thinking about our international footprint. You know, when we started really our work on this four or so years ago, it, it was really mostly focused on the governance around the mining sector. And that work has expanded and evolved and has actually become quite quite comprehensive. As I mentioned, we have this, this technical assistance that we've been working on, but really first and foremost, we need to do our job as a government to promote and adhere to the highest standards and really make this a race to the top. So we do that in a couple of ways and we'll continue to expand those efforts. We're working with countries that have these resources with technical assistance in Argentina and Uganda and expanding that work, 
not just to focus on the very important regulatory uh, reforms required to properly tender and manage uh, mine sites, uh, but to also think about how do you bring renewables and greenhouse gas accounting and all these other elements to ensure that you're sourcing these materials in the most sustainable way possible. Um, that's one element. Uh, by doing that, by working with governments to enhance some of these standards, and one of the things that we developed uh, was something that we call the ERGI toolkit, Mm -hmm. um, which is an online toolkit available in multiple languages that shares and reinforces best practices in mining development, helping all users, so many of those users being actual mining sector professionals in uh, specific countries, on how to implement some of the industry leading practices. Uh, the, it has a step-by-step -step guide, strategies, policies, um, and uh, a lot more information. And developing these tools and making them publicly available is to really ensure that we're working with countries in a way that helps them attract and develop the conditions to bring in that private investment. The other element to our work is identifying where those gaps are. So governance on the mining, on the production is incredibly important, strong governance and openness, but we need to think about where there are gaps and then strategies to help mitigate that. And then lastly, well, not lastly, but, you know, continue to promote the science and technology pieces. Now, we can't do this alone um, as a government by ourselves, although we have some really interesting and exciting elements uh, as part of our domestic policy right now um, in the bipartisan infrastructure package, as well as some other um, work that is that is moving forward. Um, but we need to work with the private sector really closely, and we'll be launching next month, a Clean Energy Resource Advisory Committee, they'll be bringing in private sector representatives across the whole value chain. So that will include some mining companies that have been invited to participate all the way to the OEMs and really every player in between to help inform and help us evolve our policy as, as we continue to develop it. So I think this is a multifaceted approach and our team works very closely with our domestic counterparts to understand how we can leverage what work we're doing at home overseas. But I think these are really kind of the core elements um, that we need to, to continue to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it's so many threads to pull out there. I mean, you mentioned a multifaceted strategy. You gave me a multifaceted set of answers, sorry, questions to follow up on, which is great because you managed to steal one of my other questions by asking, by mentioning a race to the top when I was gonna ask, how do we avoid a race to the bottom? But I, I wanna turn kind of back to this geopolitical question before that. Uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Lute, one of the things the senator mentioned, and I think in a way, the, the elephant in the room here in this discussion is the role of China throughout this supply chain. And obviously, uh, you know, at a geopolitical level, the U.S.-China relationship is, you know, one of the one at the foreground of not just the energy the geopolitics, the energy transition, but the broader geopolitical you know, dynamic we're seeing uh, currently. Uh, that said, when it comes to these mineral supply chains, I, I feel like we're seeing so much mineral demand about to come on the horizon that China, it's rather an inevitability that China will play a role somewhat. How should, you know, the, how should the United States be thinking of the role of China within this issue, but well as, as part of one of several issues within the broader geopolitics of the energy transition? Well, you know, I think, Reed, you're right. I mean, this, this issue in particular is a microcosm uh, of uh, how we'll have to deal, we will have to deal with China going forward. And it will be a blend of competition uh, and cooperation. I mean, without China's cooperation on this front, critical minerals, we just don't get there from mm -hmm. here. I mean, as I mean, if we just take any one of these slices, just take cobalt. I mean, we already heard the data, right? We don't get to the cobalt requirements that we need to move to a green economy without China. I mean, we just don't, not in anything like our lifetime. So this is a good example of both cooperate of how we're going to have to cooperate with China on some things. But you know, more broadly, um, this topic reminds me that we tend to develop strategies. So in this case, say the climate strategy or the green economy strategy, uh, in, in compartments, in governmental compartments or segments that don't tend to overlap and integrate with other strategies. So uh, recently there was an Indo-PAC strategy developed by the National Security Council issued by the administration. First of all, I, I would say it's not a strategy because it doesn't drive all the way through to resources. So it's sort of a, a concept paper. It's, it's, a, it's a list of aspirations, but it's not yet 
a strategy. But in that Indo-Pak strategy, I found nothing on this topic. Um, and soon we'll get a national defense strategy, right? And this topic, which intersects national defense as the senator outlined, but also intersects because the defense sector will be a competitor with the private sector and other elements of the government sector for these same, these same critical minerals. I'll wager that we'll get a national defense strategy that gives only a glancing mention of this topic as well. So we don't tend to integrate our strategies across these different challenges. And then the result is we work in compartments and we treat these problems as though they're sort of isolated, isolatable. And in fact, they're not, they're interconnected. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, one item which you touched on very briefly, but has been a thread throughout the comments that Helena and Ambassador Fahm have made as well, which is this question of governance and sustainability. Um, and, it, you know, we we tend to use the framing of ESG quite frequently, you know, when we talk about anything related to the energy transition. But I think it's particularly powerful when you're talking about these mineral issues. And I, I'd like to turn to that now. And, uh, you know, Dr. Fahm, I'd, I'd like to start with you first. You know, Currently, we see in the current supply chain, you know, uh, the gamut of, you know, sustainability risks and opportunities, right? How do we, you know, see through the, in some ways, how do we see the, how do we avoid uh, really just missing the forest from the trees in a way and, and saying, you know, where are the sustainability opportunities that we should be maximizing? Um, and taking advantage of? And where are the big improvements in sustainability and governance we need to uh, really be looking towards? And I, I say this as a way to tee up Helena on this question where I'm going to ask her, you know, after you identify all these challenges and opportunities, what Ergi is going to do to help fix them. So, uh, Ambassador Fahm, what, what are your thoughts there? Well, thank you, Reid. Uh, you know, the I think the, the, the theme that I think all of us are bringing uh, the, I, the thread I'm seeing throughout all this is that it's going to take something that involves a little of everything. I think uh, that's the theme that uh, began with Senator Murkowski's remarks and way through. And I think uh, there's actually a, a case study that I like to point to of recognizing you can't disengage, but still being, is what the Japanese have done. And I like to single them out because they've actually done, uh, they were the first country hit with a de facto embargo on access to critical rare rare earth elements back in 2010 when there was a unpleasant Coast Guard incident uh, with their neighbor to the West. And from that, they took away that they needed to secure their supply chains. They were ahead of the curve. What they did was they didn't cut off. They, they knew they, there was no cutting off. They were The economies are integrated. They, there's no replacing their supplies. They continue to this day to purchase uh, uh, process rare earth from China, but they also invested heavily in one of the only three working uh, rare earth mines in the world, uh, the Mount Weld mine run by Linus in Australia, and have essentially secured the offtake for that through the 2030s. So unfortunately that's an asset that's spoken for. And they're putting that away into a strategic reserve, recognizing that in the event of conflict or in the event of, of political differences, they have a rainy day fund. And that's an example of one, one set of uh, critical minerals, one country, but how they did it. And I think that same type of multifaceted approach has to guide us. Uh, we, I began by speaking about cobalt. Uh, cobalt is produced primarily in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 70% uh, of it. And yet that's a country that we now have uh, after its first peace several years ago, we have a privileged partnership uh, for peace and prosperity that the U U.S. government has with that government. And that can be built upon. Th they have a number of issues, including in the governance sector, but slowly but surely reforms have been coming. And I wrote a piece about that recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about how there's an opportunity there to engage. But I think there's an opportunity to also seize the high ground, uh, bring, help them capture the value chain in their own country, something that's very popular there. It's very popular on the African continent, the continent of the Biden-Harris administration is planning a U.S.-Africa summit sometime later this year. So that's an argument that, uh, and it'll also ensure better ESG. So uh, there's a lot there that we can do. And so seizing those opportunities when they come. Uh, and I think 
uh, going back to a point I made earlier, I'll just close with this. We also need to recognize that we that beyond cases where we can optimize, there are cases where we have to look at how we de-risk uh, and do the best we can in suboptimal conditions. And that has to be part of our strategy. Hmm. I think, you know, again, so now I'm going to unfairly uh, turn to Helena somewhat and force her as the as our USG representative on this panel and explain what the solution is here. But I think, uh, you know, the idea is around, you know, how do you ad- identifying those sustainability opportunities and taking advantage of them uh, are is really at kind of the core of what URI is trying to accomplish. I might ask you to broaden that look somewhat to help bring in some of the questions we're getting from the audience is, you know, how do you apply those those principles across the entire supply chain to include, uh, you know, the full life cycle of the mineral supply chain? I mean, we're getting a lot of questions in, in the in the chat here about recycling, for example. Uh, you know, how do you take that holistic look at sustainability? It, it's a great question. And, and maybe I can answer it talking a little bit about how our domestic and international opportunities can can mutually support each other in in this way. Um, So a major priority uh, for us is laying the groundwork for recycling to increasingly become a a larger part of the solution, right? As we're thinking about our security of supply. Um, The bipartisan infrastructure law is investing more than $7 billion in EV battery supply chains over the next five years, right? And a large portion of that is going directly to recycling. Mm -hmm. So while we know that the diversity of supply and the need to work, not just at beefing up our our resources at home, but with partners um, overseas is a critical element in the short and medium term the idea of how we can work to develop circular economies in which minerals, metals, recycling, especially for EV batteries, become more economical and standard practice. And while we're doing this at home, we are trying to export that knowledge in real time. So I mentioned our Ergi toolkit. We also are, are running an initiative called Ergi Academy, where we bring uh, countries and representatives from mining uh, company, or excuse me, mining uh, ministries from around the world to Reno, Nevada, to learn some of the best practices as we're developing them here at home. But our work is beyond ERGI, right? There's many other elements that um, we can be and are actively working on, including the appropriate information sharing and partnerships with other countries. But to stay on the line of this particular set of questioning, um, Maybe I'll touch on, you know, how we're looking at ESG, because as you mentioned, there's so many different elements and and, and ways that um, you can reference ESG standards in a conversation like this. And in order to continue to do risk these projects and make more markets attractive over time, markets that and partnerships that we would have not seen as feasible just a few years ago, this is an incredibly important element of any strategic approach we take. Um, And We do this in a lot of different ways, but one of the kind of additional elements that we didn't talk about yet is ensuring that as we are working on our technical assistance and our partnerships with other countries, that we're discussing and and, and bringing knowledge on how we address issues and continue to limit the direct and indirect environmental impacts of mining to water, soil, soil, ecosystems, human livelihood, and once again, continuing to do that work on reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the sector and then uh, secondary processing. But this also includes other social concerns, right? Workers' safety and rights, community consultations and development, environmental justice. We know for these operations to continue to, to persevere in a community, these are all elements that need to be addressed. It's challenges we have at home and there's challenges we experience overseas. Um, So when I said it earlier, I'll I'll say it again, um, the the goal is to really create a race to the top. And that is really our best line of defense um, on how to to address these issues and bring ESG and recycling into the broader remit of our diplomatic engagement on this issue. And I think I want to 
you know, stay with you, Paulina, on, on this item of a race to the top as it relates to, you know, these issues of sustainability and governance in particular. And, you know, specifically speak to the role of, I guess, the private sector in, in that piece. You mentioned your private sector advisory group, which you're in the process of launching. You know, as you as the U.S. government goes about building and facilitating these partnerships, how do you, you know, bring along the private sector in that effort, particularly given, you know, the need to de-risk this space somewhat, both from a national security and from, a, you know, an ease of doing business perspective in some cases, uh, you know, what's planned in that in that space? Yeah, so, I mean, I think what's so interesting about this issue is that, you know, the private sector we're referring to isn't just mining companies, mm. it's anode producers, cathode producers, battery pack manufacturers, it's OEMs, uh, ones from, from Tesla to those that are just starting to develop, right, the breadth of their um, EV opportunities. That's a very interesting set of end users of, of these critical minerals and metals that we're discussing today. And they all approach the issue and how to attract investment, how to make their own business decisions in different but related ways. And over the next few years, and we've seen, you know, shifts and and, and this changing um, the, the commodities that drive these markets um, will increasingly be more interrelated with each other. So we talked a little bit earlier about lithium prices and nickel prices. Um, and there's just a lot that we need to, to learn, especially as business models change and maybe we'll see some integration across the supply chain. So an open line of communication with industry is crucial to help us continue to understand the best policy tools to, to deploy. I think marrying that with some of the efforts I mentioned earlier which is really working with where the USG has a, a, a strong uh, background in history and promoting science and technology to, to meet these needs. You know, working with our own R&D capabilities, also informed, right, by, by the private sector. I think we had a reference to the loan guarantee program before that has, you know, $17 billion for new emerging technologies. Um, this isn't just about securing supply, but at the end of the day, developing EV batteries that are less mineral intensive and easier to recycle. Thinking about new approaches to processing and recycling minerals, such as rare earth elements, which we just saw a new funding announcement about, and then applying that best science and technology to reducing environmental impacts of mining and processing. Um, so all of these are incredibly interrelated and to ensure that we are really developing and evolving our policy in the most thoughtful way, conversations like these need to be, to, to be ongoing. I think Dr. Dr. Feynman and Ambassador Lute, I might turn to you on this question of, you know, the the role of the private sector in this space. You know, uh, elsewhere we look at these supply chains; they tend to be, you know, dominated. Uh, you know, uh, or you know, national companies tend to play a significant role in a lot of these industries. Whereas the U.S. has a U.S. and its partners and allies have a significant innovation ecosystem emerging from the private sector. How can that best be leveraged? Uh, in either of your opinion, to, you know, loosen some of these issues. Uh, Dr. Fahm, I might start with you, and then uh, Ambassador Lute, I'll go to you. Thank, thank you, Reid. I think the we are, and I think it, it our innovation is based on letting the, the private sector take the lead. But go, the government has a role as well, and I think it, it's in signaling. And there are various ways of saying there are certainly rhetorical signaling, uh, that's important. I think the executive order, the 100 day review, those were important signals. Uh, the executive order that largely didn't get as much coverage was the one President Biden signed in October, actually on Halloween, is uh, executive order 14, uh, 051 on the defense uh, strategic reserve of critical minerals and on the authority with regard to that. So those signals can be important but also signals can come in forms of uh, financing. The De uh, Development Finance Corporation, DFC, has invested uh, through its support of certain private funds, uh, indirectly invested also in strategic minerals in companies that are racing the top, that have that. So that that's another signal. I think offtake agreements are yet another signal. So there's a, there is a role uh, for government to to play in all this. And I think uh, that's an important one to, to, to keep in mind and to incorporate that within an overall strategy. Mm -hmm. 
You know, let me let me agree with Peter. I think the private sector will dominate this. I mean, you can't believe in the market economy and say otherwise, right? I mean, I think the, the private sector will dominate, but there are roles for government. In particular, uh, the governmental role should begin with a very co comprehensive and differentiated view of potential partners, right? So on the one hand, we've heard today talk of mining in Australia. Hey, that's good news for us, Australia is a, is a strong ally, right? Or we've heard of strategic reserves held by Japan, another strong ally. So those kind of mark one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, we've got China controlling 70 or 80% of all cobalt. And China is a strategic competitor. We know that Russia, another strategic competitor, uh, has a dominant marketplace uh, position in some of these minerals. And then in between those, we have a bunch of countries who are important in this space, but who otherwise we might almost ignore. So I think we have to figure out sort of a triage approach of how can we reinforce our closest allies? How can they help us in this space? How can we deal with our competitors? And in some cases, as Peter mentioned, uh, uh, differentiate even among our inside our competitors between firms that are firms and companies, producers who are essentially arms of the state and those which are more closer to free market players traded on the stock exchange, transparency, international uh, international norms of, uh, of doing business. And then be willing to deal with some of those firms that even though they may be Chinese, uh, we, can, uh, we can count on them to be more transparent and more predictable than, um, than perhaps state-owned firms. So it's a very this is a very complex, and I, I mean, I applaud Elena and her colleagues who try to deal with every, this every day. This is not a simple issue, um, and it really requires good government work uh, connected to the private, uh, the private sector. So we're, we're, we're coming down to the witching hour here, and I, I want to uh, give each of you the opportunity to kind of leave us with some closing remarks. However, I'm going to take moderator's privilege and, and do my best to shape you towards a specific direction for those closing remarks. So Helena, I might, might turn to you first. You know, uh, the theme of this conversation, it seems to be what tools does the United States have at its disposal to uh, improve its position in this space? And how does it then intend to turn those into an applicable strategy? Uh, you know, what messages would you leave us with that as the United States aims to, you know, walk the balance between leveraging domestic resources, domestic expertise and, and domestic demand, quite frankly, with a profound ability to leverage international partnerships? Yes, I think there was a couple of really key themes, although we're all representing different perspectives here. There's there's a lot of commonality in some of the elements we, we were discussing. Um, I think there's one really key goal, which is we're saying that we need to continue to attract open, transparent private investment to the sector at home and overseas, that diversity and resilience of supply and um, ability to, to receive these end use products is of, of, of top of mind. Um, and we have quite a few tools in our toolbox to do that. And we, we touched upon them already, so I'll just summarize briefly. Uh, you know, the US has, and, and many of our of our more like-minded partners, a, a strong legacy of innovation and our ability to, to, to share that, uh, to move forward at the needle in creative ways. It isn't all about securing more supply, but also about using what we have more strategically. Thinking about in the international context, how do we have those conversations with different configurations of, of, of countries? Uh, I might organize my, my map a little bit differently, but I think that's a very fair point. And really thinking about where and how we have tools that can help deploy and catalyze other finance. And then lastly, you know, I'd be remiss to say as a representative from State Department, uh, I would never underestimate our diplomatic reach and our footprint in over 192 countries is really impactful and carrying this conversation and educating our officers on how to have um, this, this part of our expanding definition of energy diplomacy and understanding of the role that these minerals and materials play in the context of our bilateral relationships is incredibly important. I'll leave it there. 
Uh, Ambassador Fahm, I, you know, I might turn to you next for any closing thoughts. You know, you you ran the the, the entire spectrum of both the, the geopolitics, the, the supply demand, dislocation issues that we have, as well as the ESG issues. What are the key threads that you're noticing that we need to uh, take moving forward from this conversation? Well, I think uh, if I could leave us with one thought, it's the thought that really the world has changed. Uh, clearly, uh, the demand has changed. Where we're headed is a new, hopefully brighter, cleaner future. But that's going to also require a change of mentality. Uh, where are our priorities? The geopolitics of energy and the geoeconomics have, in a way, scrambled the map we once had. And so we're going to have to pay attention to different parts of the world. I, you know, no secret, my soft spot for the heart of Africa, but there are other places that are strategic as well. But I think places that once were perhaps not in the forefront of our thoughts will need to be. And uh, places that were strategic competitors in one domain may actually turn out to be strategic partners in another. So what I, I would leave us with is the idea that this is a brave new world we're entering into, and we have to do so with an open mind uh, and not drag the baggage of the past into it. But really, as Helena said, I think quite appropriately, uh, you know, you know, make a race for the top. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ambassador Lute, uh, you know, I, I'm finishing with you because you started your first opening remarks by saying, you know, we need a strategy. You're a strategist. You recognize that there's, you know, a, a, a strategic gap here. You know, through this conversation, what are the gaps that you think remain and what are the positive elements of a burgeoning strategy that we should be recognizing and taking forward? Well, Reed, I think uh, it might be appropriate to close with the main gap. The mm -hmm. main gap here is a gap of awareness. Uh, and it's awareness of the point Peter just made, which is that we are entering a new arena. You know, um, Americans might be um, accustomed mostly to being independent, self-sufficient on uh, given our, you know, the treasures, the, the, the bounty of our geographic position, our security and so forth. We're entering a new world here where we are, we are forced to, to appreciate the interconnections, the interdependence of this global economy. And we've just today dealt with only one sector, but the same sorts of themes, you know, the Atlantic Council could host subsequent panels on all sorts of different sectors um, that have the same basic theme. And the theme is interconnectivity, interdependence, and therefore a new approach uh, to the way we, uh, we, we compete and, and cooperate in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the key thing is sort of opening our eyes mm -hmm. to the fact that the future is not going to look like the past in this arena. And I think if we have a if we have a you know a lot of opening our eyes to do, I think we have you know there's plenty of work still to be done in that in that category. You know, or we started with the conversation just the breadth of both economic sectors, as you mentioned, Ambassador Lute, as well as the the number of minerals and submetals that we're talking about when we talk about critical minerals in their respective supply chain. So I think that's a good place to end. I'd like to thank our uh, distinguished panelists for joining us today. I just apologize for holding them a bit longer than we had originally intended. I'd also like to thank the Senator uh, in absentia for her, for her remarks. I think those are incredibly powerful related to, you know, where the U.S. has wealth currently and can use that wealth most appropriately. Uh, and then finally, I'd also like to thank uh, the rest of the team here at the Atlantic Council, uh, Patty Ryan, Lauren Holland, Jasper Gillardi, and Eamon Coughlin uh, for their work in pulling this event together. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't plug the Atlantic Council's work in this space. We're going to be doing more of this type of stuff uh, as these issues continue to unfold and dominate the next phase of the energy transition. Uh, and we'll be covering this in particular at our forthcoming Global Energy Forum, March 28th and 29th. Uh, and more details on that can be found on our website. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank everybody once again, and uh, we'll see you next time.